one of the great poets of English poetry was William Blake. He lived <coughs> from 1757 to 1827. And two of his poems that I think are very striking, and I especially see this as a Christian minister. One is the poem of the lamb, the other is the poem of the tiger. In the poem of the lamb, it goes, some, it goes like this. Little lamb, who made thee? Dost thou know who made thee? Gave thee life and bid thee feed? by the streams and o'er the mead, gave thee clothing of delight, softest clothing woolly bright, gave thee such a tender voice, making all the veils rejoice. Little lamb, who made thee? Dost thou know who made thee? Little lamb, I'll tell thee, little lamb, I'll tell thee, he is called by thy name, for he calls himself a lamb. He is meek and he is mild. He became a little child, a child, and thou or I a child, and thou a lamb. We are called by his name. Little lamb, God bless thee. Little lamb, God bless thee. And then another poem that is striking as well is the one called The Tiger. Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forest of the night, what a mortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? In what distant Deeps or skies burnt the fire of thine eyes? On what wings dare he aspire? What the hand dare seize the fire? And what shoulder and what art could twist the sinews of thy heart? And when the heart began to beat, what dread hand and what dread feet? What the hammer, what the chain, in what furnace was thy brain? What the anvil, what dread grasp dare its deadly terrors clasp? When the stars threw down their spears and watered heaven with their tears, did he smile his work to see? Did he who made the lamb make thee? Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forest of the night. When a mortal hand or eye dare frame thy fearful symmetry. As I was reading William Blake, I thought about the Bible, the Hebrew Bible, and also the Greek New Testament. And as we think about the Hebrew Bible, there is a reference to the lion, uh, tiger and lion of the same family, and it's in Genesis chapter 49. It reads like this, Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you are gone up. He stooped down, he crouched as a lion, and as a lioness, who will rouse him? And then this very interesting verse, verse 10. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet. And literally, I translate the Hebrew, Ad ki yavo shiloh, until Shiloh come. And unto him shall be the obedience of the peoples. A great messianic text, I believe, and we'll see that in the book of Revelation. But permeating the New Testament is also the reference to the Lamb. And I would like to share some passages about the Lamb that 
remind us of the lamb as well uh, as the lion. And I'm thinking in John chapter 1, verse 29, we see John the Baptist making a reference to the lamb. And we are told in verse 29 that as he saw Jesus, he cried out and he said, Behold the Lamb of God. This is in John 1, verse 29. Behold the Lamb of God. Omnis to thou. Omnis is the Greek word for lamb who takes away the sin of the world. That's the first reference to lamb. I also thought as a Hebrew teacher, uh, a seminary, former seminary professor, that Isaiah 53 talks about the lamb of God in a predictive prophecy that Jesus Christ uh, was smitten like a lamb. As a lamb, he was brought to the slaughter. And it's looking at, I believe, his vicarious atonement in Isaiah chapter 53. We see it again, announced here in John. And then in the book of Revelation, we see the lamb in a number of references in Revelation. I especially love Revelation chapter 4 and 5, where we have a series of hymns. And in these hymns, they are hymns to the Lamb. It is interesting, as we pick up in chapter 5 of Revelation, he sees a scroll, and he sees a lamb. No one was found worthy to open the book of this scroll. However, John is told, as he's telling this, stop crying, behold, the Lamb has conquered, in verse 5. Behold the lamb, which is of the tribe, or excuse me, the lion, I should say, of the tribe of Judah has conquered. And then we'll come to the lamb. First of all, the lion. And my mind goes back to Genesis chapter 49. The lion, tiger, same family we could say. The lion out of the tribe of Judah has conquered the root of David to open the book and its seven seals. Again. A prophecy, I believe, from chapter 49 of the book of Genesis, the Lion of the tribe of Judah. There used to be a song that I remember years ago uh, teaching at a college that students used to enjoy singing, Oh, the Lion, the Lion, or the, uh, the Lion of Judah has conquered to open the book and its seals. And what a beautiful fulfillment of that imagery. But then back to back with that is the lamb. We are told in verse 6 and following that John says, I saw in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders, a lamb, an arneon, standing as having been slain. And yet now, it's standing, looking again at Christ, who is that lamb that was slain that is now having seven horns and seven eyes, full of power with the seven horns, full of eyes, full of understanding, and the one who has sent forth the fullness of the seven spirits of God, no doubt a reference to the Holy Spirit. And he comes and takes the book out of the throne sitter, which is God, and we're told that the 24 elders fall down before the lamb, each having a harp and a golden bowl, and they begin to praise God and now to praise the lamb. They've already been praising God the Father. And notice it says in verse 9, they sing a new song saying, Worthy are you to receive the book and to open its seals because you were slain and you have redeemed to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and you have made them to our God a kingdom and priest, and they shall reign upon the earth. That's the song to the Lamb that we find in chapter 5. And the song continues. I saw 
and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the living creatures and the 24 elders and their number was 10,000 times 10,000. And they are singing a song, worthy is the lamb again. The Arneon, the lamb, which has been slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And then all creation under heaven joins in this song. All creation everywhere singing, I believe, to God the Father, to the one who sits upon the throne, and to Arneo, and to the Lamb. Notice equally receiving this glorious praise of blessing and honor and glory and power forever and forever. So the imagery of the Lamb continues throughout the book of Revelation. We have the Lamb in chapter 12 again. Verse 11, we are told, speaking of those who have received victory over Satan and his kingdom, these have conquered him on account of the blood of the Lamb and on account of the word of their testimony. So again, it's through the sacrifice of Christ that victory over Satan and his kingdom by the Lamb is talked about in the book of Revelation. We also find the lamb referred to again. We have the marriage supper of the lamb, uh, looking, I believe, at that eternal supper in eternity. But then we also have the idea in a new heaven and new earth of the lamb being there. For example, in Revelation chapter 21, uh, verse 9, it reads as follows. And one out of the seven angels came who was having the seven uh, plagues, uh, which are full, or having the seven bulls, which are full of the last plagues, spoke with me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. The wife of the Lamb represents in John, in John's theology, the church, and that eternal meal throughout eternity that is promised in the book of Revelation. We also have another reference to the Lamb in 21, verses 22 and 23. Notice 21, 22, and 23. And there was no temple. And now he's looking at a new heaven and new earth, where there was no temple for the Lord God Almighty is the temple and the lamb, ta or neon. In other words, there's no need of a temple anymore in that new heaven and new earth, for the lamb is there. And then it is also interesting, as we look at the book of Revelation, that we continue to see the lamb again. And this is found in Revelation chapter 22, verse 1, where we see the lamb, he showed me a river of water of life, bright and as crystal, coming out of the throne of God and out of the lamb, to Arneo, out of the lamb. And what is beautiful about this imagery, it permeates the New Testament. And I cannot help but think that William Blake must have had quite a knowledge of biblical uh, can I say, Revelation, and especially the New Testament, where we see the Lamb permeating the New Testament writings, especially the Gospel of John, and especially the book of, of Revelation. But we also see the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Now, whether we can make a tiger and a lion be the same, I'm not sure of that, but they're from the same family. And I'm wondering when he talks about how, who made you, Tagger, uh, and who made the lamb, I'm wondering if there's not that kind of dual imagery that we see in Revelation 5. We see the lion of the tribe of Judah and the lamb, which represents Christ, having died and is now resurrected and having overcome through his death and giving redemption to all who are willing 
to accept the lamb and believe in him. So as I read the poet, and I read, as I read those two poems, my mind reflected on what I'm understanding as a Christian minister in light of the New Testament and how those great uh, images are used, especially the lamb, repeatedly throughout the New Testament. The real challenge, I think, in all of our lives is, do we know the Lamb? May we give our lives to the Lamb because He's the one that brings redemption through His death and sacrifice, and He's the one that will be in the new heaven and new earth forever and forever. And that is the beautiful truth that all who put their faith in Christ can share in that eternal blessing with the Father and with the Lamb and with the Holy Spirit. What a beautiful, beautiful uh, teaching that we find there.